Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and I'm sure one of yours, faith, the power of faith in God. We come today to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. This is called the faith chapter. We know the love chapter in 1 Corinthians and the resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15. This is one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. The writer talks to us about the power of faith. The watchwords of the Christian life are by faith. We live by faith. The writer of Hebrews compiles the greatest stories of faith from the Old Testament as he teaches us about the power of faith in God. We're challenged in Hebrews to live by faith in face of both cultural challenges and personal difficulties in our lives. The first truth that we see in Hebrews 11 is faith clarified. What is faith? What does it even mean to have faith? So the scripture tells us here in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The King James says faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's what this word confidence means. It means the basis of truth, the foundation. It's like the house has a foundation. What's the foundation of faith? True faith rests on a firm foundation. It's having this strong, confident faith in God. Not wondering if God's going to be faithful, not wishful thinking, but confidence in the things that we ask God for. He says that faith is assurance. You know, that's when faith grows up and it's mature. It has this deep, settled assurance. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is faithful to us as people. It is the standard by which we test something. The assurance of something here in this passage in the Greek language is the standard by which we measure something and we test something. So faith is being sure of what we hope for. It's being certain of what we do not see. And God commends our faith, and there's a commendation. We all like to get commendations and rewards, and God commends our faith. And he says in verse 2, this is what the ancients, the people of the Old Testament, what they were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God commends our faith. Faith in God is an honorable thing. Sometimes people will maybe make fun of faith. Or say that they're living without faith as though that's some higher form of intellectual reasoning. But God commends faith. Faith is a great noble quality for people to have. Anybody can have unbelief. Anybody can have skepticism. Doesn't take any kind of effort or training to just shut our minds off to the truth of God. But faith is a commendable value in every person's life. And it will bless your life in every way to trust God. Faith enables us to understand the creation. It enables us to understand science and the power of God displayed in creation. He says, by faith, we understand. When you open your mind to the things of God, you'll understand more about life. Scripture and science are completely compatible. There's nothing in science that refutes anything in the Bible. I've studied both intricately on these points. But when you understand not just the science of what we can observe in God's world, but you understand that it is God who brought it all into being, then you have a complete picture of the universe and of life. All the science that we know is true, valid. It's It's a discovery of God's incredible world. But God is the one who created it. God is the one who set the laws in motion. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command. So just as you can gain understanding to grow your faith, The more faith you have, the more you will understand because you've opened your mind to see God at work in the world and in your life. And if you don't see God at work, you're going to have a very narrow view of things. You'll have a very narrow view of science. You'll have a very narrow view of the world and science as we know it. But when you understand that God exists, that God is the cause of all things, that God is at work by faith, we understand it'll lead you to a greater understanding of life and making meaning out of your life and making sense out of everything. Third of all, he tells us that faith is to be celebrated. This is a magnificent passage he continues with here. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He tells us right here in verse 6 of Hebrews 11 that faith is an indispensable element in pleasing God. Without faith, we can't please God. I mean, there's nothing more insulting to God than to dismiss him or discredit him or to claim that he doesn't exist, to disbelieve. 
But when you trust God, it's the greatest honor you can give to God as your creator and as your father. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 14, 1, that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That is a very foolish assumption to say that God doesn't even exist. I've never understood atheism. Agnostics, I kind of get. They believe that there's a God. They're not really sure everything about him. But to just assume that there is no God, you'd have to have all the data in the universe to make that kind of an assumption. So that's not an intellectual conclusion. That's not a rational conclusion because you don't have all the information to make it. People should always give room for the possibility of God. That in and of itself is a small part of faith. It's the beginning of leading you into a life of faith if you're skeptical. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And he says that true faith believes two things, that God exists and that God cares about us. That's what he means by he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Those who pursue a relationship with God. Those who live their lives with awareness that God exists and that God cares about us. So those are the two elements of faith. God says, I want you to believe that I exist and believe that I'll work in your life. Believe that I'll reward you for your faith. Well, then he characterizes faith in Hebrews 11. He tells us these amazing stories. And we could spend weeks together in our study if I were to go through each one of the stories of these men and women of faith. But he tells us about Abel and his faith in God, demonstrated in his worship, son of Adam and Eve. And he tells us about Noah's faith when the great flood came how he built an ark to save his family, and that others discredited that there would even be a flood, but he persevered in his faith. He tells us about Abraham, who's called the man of faith. Abraham's story is told over and over in the New Testament, especially in the book of Romans and Galatians, as an example of living by faith. He tells us of Abraham's faith and trusting God when he tested his faith and how God led him to a new land, the land of Canaan, which today is the beautiful land of Israel. He tells us of Moses, that even though he grew up miraculously spared from Pharaoh's attempt to annihilate the young boys of Israel out of threat of the growing Israelite community and how he grew up in Pharaoh's household, and yet there came the time as a young man that he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but he chose to be mistreated along with God's people, that he persevered. He led the people out of Egyptian bondage, which a great example of faith Moses is. He tells us of the people of Israel that it took them a lot of faith just to get out of Egypt. They were stuck in there for 400 years as slaves and servants. Very frightening for them to leave Egypt. That's all they knew, but they ventured across the desert. They crossed the Red Sea by faith. He tells us all these amazing personal stories. And these are the ancients. Earlier, he said, they were all commended for their faith. Abel and Noah and Abraham and Moses so many of these great men and women of faith in the Old Testament. But then at the end of this, he gives us a contrast of two different kinds of faith. And this is important to note because he talks about a faith to escape the difficulties of life, but he also talks about a faith to endure the difficulties of life. I point this out because sometimes people have a fantasy view of faith. They think that faith is a cure-all for all their problems, that if they have faith in God, they shouldn't be going through any problems. But faith is a gift God gave us to cope with this life, to deal with this life as it is. It's not a fantasy. It's not a denial of reality. And Many people in what some have called a faith movement have really distorted the meaning of faith and really created a crisis of faith because people begin to live in this fantasy that if they have faith in God, they're going to have a perfect life. But you know, when you believe something like that, which is not validated in Scripture, then when problems come, that's what creates a crisis of faith. People don't have the ability to cope with life. So there are are two kinds of faith. There is a faith at times that causes us to escape, and every one of us have had God deliver us from situations before. We've seen the deliverance of the Lord. We have escaped many things, all of us have. And he writes about those because of faith in God. They escaped a lot of things. He writes at the end of this chapter of those who through their faith conquered kingdoms. They administered justice. They gained what was promised. 
They shut the mouths of lions, as in the Daniel story. They quenched the fear of the flames, as in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They escaped the age of the sword, people that won great victories. Their weakness was turned into strength. They became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies, as in the days of Gideon. The women received back their dead, raised to life again. We see that in the miracles of Elijah and Elisha. Those are great miracles. And if you trust God with your life, you're going to experience great miracles. You're going to come to situations and God just miraculously delivers you from it. You're going to get thrown in a lion's den for doing the right thing, by the way. You'll get persecuted for righteousness sake, like Daniel was. God will shut the mouths of life. The thing you think is going to devour you and your family it won't even touch you. You're going to get thrown in the fire sometimes and you're going to come out unscathed. You're going to experience incredible miracles and you'll always remember those stories. You think, how in the world did we ever escape that? I've had many experiences like that. I've seen the power of God because I trusted him. I called upon him in a moment of need. There are other situations, though, that we go through in life where we need a faith of endurance. And that same faith gets us through it. Sometimes faith takes us out of it. Sometimes it takes us through it. And so he talks about other people in Old Testament times that also went through some difficult times, and yet they kept their faith, and their faith brought them through. This chapter ends with him talking about those who endured by faith. A faith that gets you out of it, faith that takes you through it. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. He says the world was not worthy of these great people. They wandered in deserts and mountains and living in caves and in holes in the ground. He tells a story of people that were persecuted, prophets who were persecuted. Elijah, for example, prophesied a famine on the land. In the days of the wicked King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, God told him there was a famine coming. It was a punishment. It was a divine punishment on the nation for idolatry. God's punishment was designed to bring them back to him, not to destroy them, but to deliver them. But that angered King Ahab and Jezebel. She threatened to kill him, and he had to go flee into the desert. But God kept him, put him by the brook of Cherith, and a raven brought him food to eat and had an endless water supply in that little brook, even at a time of famine. How many of those great men and women of the Old Testament were persecuted? Some of those prophets were even killed for being faithful. And yet, they endured the suffering. The great story of Job is a classic example, the ultimate example. A man who feared God. The opening chapter of Job tells us he feared God, he shunned evil. He was the greatest man in all the East. He was wealthy. He was influential. And every imaginable problem came into his life. The death of his children in a tragic storm. The grief of a parent. Mercenaries that attacked his farm. Stole cattle and oxen. Left him desolate. Then he got physically sick. Even his friends kind of turned against him and said, God's punishing you because you don't have any faith. Well, that's the last thing that's true about Job. He's the one that did have faith. In fact, his faith brought him through it. He endured it. At the end of it, God turned the captivity of Job, it says. He restored his fortunes is what that means in the Hebrew language as well. God blessed him with twice as much after that season of suffering. And the same faith that'll take you out, sometimes it'll take you through. The point is, can you hold on to your faith? Do you live by faith regardless of whether you're getting out of it or going through it? That's the real question. How deep is your faith? How true is your faith? Can you live by Hebrews 11? One faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Can you keep that faith? And that's the point of this chapter. Hold on to your faith. That's the whole point of it. Because right in chapter 10, he talks about don't shrink back into unbelief, but believe unto salvation. And he writes at the end of this chapter about the completion of faith, that these people in the Old Testament were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and that everything that they were looking forward to 
was fulfilled in Jesus. So he ends by saying these, all these great men and women of the Old Testament time, these examples of faith, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. You see, there were so many promises to come in the Messiah. So they hadn't received everything because God had planned something better for us. Now, the word better, remember, is a key word in the book of Hebrews. He's also talking about how Christ is better, the new covenant is better, and the, the cross is better than the Old Testament sacrifices, and grace is better than the law, and heaven is better than earthly Jerusalem. So here he uses that word. God had planned something better for us today, those of us who know Christ as Savior so that only together with us would they be made perfect, would God's plan be complete. In other words, the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's all the same thing. This is God's work among God's people. It is Christ that came and fulfilled all of their hopes and their dreams. All of those prophetic promises were embodied in Jesus. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. You see, God planned for Jesus to come into the world, and that completed the work of redemption for the salvation of the world. The coming of Jesus fulfilled the expectant faith of believers in the Old Testament. The plan of salvation is complete in Christ and our faith in his finished work for our eternal salvation. Today, I challenge you, as the writer of Hebrews did, to live by faith, to hold on to your faith, to trust God, to believe not only does he exist, but he rewards those who diligently seek him. Join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you today for the gift of faith, the measure of faith that you've put into our hearts. Today, I pray that you'll give your people power to live by faith and to realize that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining me today for the study of the Word. I want to ask you to make sure you subscribe to the Pastor David Cooper YouTube channel and share Dig Deep Bible Study and the Sunday services with others as well. If you're in the Atlanta area, I'm looking forward to seeing you for worship this Sunday on campus, if not online. So many worshipers, thousands around the world, every Sunday together as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. If you've accepted Christ recently as a Savior, I'd like to send you a free copy of Fresh Start. It's a book that we offer to help you begin to grow. If you want to know more about becoming a Christian or how to grow up in your faith, let us send you Fresh Start. That'll help you as well. Check out the Mount Perrin store online today. We've got some new Fearless coffee mugs that look fantastic. Our theme this year is Living Fearlessly. It's fearless, that's our theme. We have some great new products. Go online and check out the Mount Perrin store today. I think you'll find some things that'll bless you and your family, some t-shirts, some great things that brand Mount Perrin, but also they're just great artistic pieces you can have in your life and your family and share great gifts with people. It's always good to, I like to wear Mount Perrin t-shirts and the coffee mugs. It all goes together, reminds us every day that we are a family together, reminds us to pray for the ministry that God has given us together as well. Thank you for your generous and faithful support of the ministry. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday for worship.